Hello, my name is Emma Klein and I'm an AmeriCorps VISTA member at Employee and Family Resources, working on some community organizing and outreach around the opioid epidemic here in Des Moines. Um, and I'm here today to present to you a little bit about opioid misuse in central Iowa, give you a little bit of background about the opioid epidemic, and uh, hopefully we can learn something that'll be useful. So a quick outline of what I plan to talk about, a little introduction, I'm gonna go through some data, um, try to get what's important across without boring you a little, without boring you too much. Um, I've got a legislative update for those of you who live in Iowa. I've got some information about naloxone and overdose prevention, some treatment options, and then a few bits and pieces at the end of what you can do to help. So to start, we'll watch a video. The opioid epidemic. It's the deadliest drug crisis in American history, killing about 90 Americans every day roughly the same number as car crashes. Here are short answers to some key questions about the crisis. What exactly is an opioid? Opioids are a class of drugs that interact with opioid receptors on nerve cells in the body and brain. They regulate pain and affect the brain's reward or pleasure system, which can make people feel high. That makes opioids powerful painkillers, but also extremely addictive. So what is the crisis about? The current crisis started in the 1990s with the overprescription of opioid painkillers like Oxycontin. Over the next decade, a growing number of people became dependent on these drugs. And for many, what started with pills grew into a heroin addiction. Then in 2014, potent synthetic opioids like fentanyl began entering the drug supply in large amounts. Where's the crisis most severe? It's worse in the Midwest, Appalachia, and New England, but it really is a national problem. Synthetic opioids are continuing to enter new markets, especially in the Northeast and South. Why has it gotten so much worse in recent years? Decades of opioid overprescription, an influx of cheap heroin, and the emergence of fentanyl, a synthetic opioid that is 50 times more potent than heroin. Shouldn't we just stop prescribing opioids? Not necessarily. Opioids have improved the quality of life for millions of people, particularly cancer patients and those with acute pain. And suddenly removing access to opioids from those who are dependent on them to function could easily push people to more dangerous opioids like heroin or counterfeit pills. So what can be done? There are many variables, but any solution would require controlling the distribution of prescription opioids, expanding access to medication-assisted treatment, and making naloxone an overdose antidote more accessible. In addition, more controversial ideas like drug checking services or supervised injection sites may be necessary to slow the rise in overdose deaths. So I like that video, which was created by the New York Times, because I think it gives a really good broad overview of what's going on. Um, so we'll dive a little bit more into that, especially for those of you who live in Iowa uh, right now. So I'd like to start with just defining what is an opioid. Um, it is kind of a weird word. Um, opioids refer to a narcotic depressant medication that is commonly used to treat pain. There are two common ways to refer to opioids, a natural or a semi-synthetic opioid. These are opioid drugs that are derived from opium, the substance. Um, and so morphine is the most well-known and the one that comes straight from opium, but with a little bit of modification, you also get oxycodone, hydrocodone, codeine, heroin, and a few other drugs. Um, this is in contrast to synthetic opioids, which have nothing to do in their chemical structure with natural opioids, but they react or but they interact the same way with the brain. And so some examples of synthetic opioids are methadone, buprenorphine, and fentanyl. Um, you may hear the word illicit synthetic opioid frequently. Um, this refers to illegally manufactured fentanyl or fentanyl analogs. This is important when we talk about uh, the rise of fentanyl because while fentanyl is a legitimate uh, pharmaceutical medication, most fentanyl that you would find people abusing is illegally manufactured. Um, and there are many substances similar to fentanyl that may react differently. But again, we'll get into that in, in a little bit. So there are lots of different ways you can abuse opioids. Um, obviously, these are pretty commonly prescribed medications and many, many people take them without a problem. But if you take more than prescribed, take it more frequently than prescribed, um, taking a prescribed dr drug with no prescription, taking a medication for a different prescription, um, sharing it with other people, um, asking for refills, 
too soon or crushing the pills and taking them in a different form besides swallowing are all considered to be types of abuse. Causes of the opioid epidemic are extremely complicated. Um, in my opinion, if we knew what the causes were, we would be able to solve the problem. But uh, it, simply here are some of the things that have contributed to the current crisis. So the biggest one is overprescribing. Um, we'll get see this. We'll see this data in just a second. But between 1999 and 2015, to 2010, something like that, the, there's a huge rise in, prescri in prescribing. Um, this is just a supply problem. The more supply, the more addiction there tends to be. Um, there has also been a quote-unquote fraudulent or very aggressive advertising of these drugs. Um, the typical case is that of Perfu Purdue Pharma and their product OxyContin. Um, if you Google this, there is tons and tons of news articles about it. Um, I have fraudulent in quotes because I'm not sure about the legal status of that term, but it is definitely known that there were some possibly false claims made about these drugs and they were heavily marketed towards doctors and other kinds of prescribers. Um, another potential cause is called the one pill wonder mentality. This is the idea that many people will come in expecting to have no pain and an opioid is a really quick fix for that. Um, the last is the uh, the idea of deaths of despair, which is a was popularized or invented by the researchers Case and Deaton in 2015. Um, they lump in opioid overdose with other drug overdose deaths, alcohol deaths, and suicides to a wide variety of broader social forces that cause greater isolation, lower economic opportunity. Um, the disintegration of normal community infrastructure and institutions. Um, they kind of link this general societal decline, especially in the industrial Midwest and in Appalachia to these deaths of despair of which opioid overdose is one form. So again, uh, this is all of these contributed. The causes are extremely complex. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the most persuasive hypotheses. So yeah, this is what I was talking about with overprescribing. So we've got between 1999 and 2015 a huge increase in the amounts in the amount of opioids prescribed per person. Um, in the case of this slide, MME is a way to measure the strength of different types of opioid drugs. Um, so it's not necessarily a raw number of pills, but the general amount of opioid drug. Um, so as you can see, there's been a huge rise even just in 15 years. Um, this I think is a really telling slide. The gray line you can see is the opioid sales. Uh, the orange line is opioid overdose deaths and the blue line is opioid treatment admissions. And so while a correlation does not imply causation, this doesn't directly imply that sales cause deaths. It is a pretty telling graphic that sales, deaths, and treatment admissions all increased at basically the same rate over this period of time. So this has all of the important numbers. Again, I'm not going to bore you. I'll just highlight a few of the ones that I think are most important. So you can see at the top, there were 116 deaths every day in 2016 from an opioid-related overdose and 11 and a half million people misuse prescription opioids. This does not mean 11 and a half million people have addictions. Um, there's a medical definition between misuse and abuse or a misuse and a substance use disorder, but uh, 11 and a half million people could be on that path. Um, here, 2.1 million people in the middle had an opioid use disorder and almost 100,000 people used heroin. Um, the there was a huge economic cost 500 billion dollars so as you can see there are a wide variety of consequences and a huge number of people affected by this crisis so there was an estimated 63,000 drug overdoses in 2016 um, just as a comparison to help you give, get a sense of the scale in the entire vietnam war 58,000 U.S. soldiers died. In the peak of the car crash death, ep death epidemic, 55,000 Americans died. Um, 
uh, during the peak of the HIV epidemic, 43,000 died. And during the peak of gun violence, 40,000 died. So the current drug overdose crisis is worse in scale than all of these really astonishing crises in American history. Um, the other thing that's happened recently is there has been an overall reduction in the life expectancy of, American, of Americans for the past two years. Um, this is very rare. Life expectancy has been trending up in America for the past like several hundred years. Um, the first time that two consecutive years has shown a reduction was in 1962. So this is getting into some of that synthetic opioid stuff that I was talking about. As you can see, since 2000, uh, overdose deaths involving opioids trended up um, approximately along the line of this purple one, which is those natural and semi-synthetic com commonly prescribed opioids. And then we can see here in 2013 to 2014 was really when we started to see the fentanyl crisis, and that has just caused a huge spike in overdose deaths. So for those of you who live in Iowa, I'm showing these rates, uh, these maps of o opioid prescribing rates, just to get a sense of, you know, as, we, as we've seen, a higher prescribing tends to correlate to higher instance of opioid use disorder. And so here in Iowa, we're we've got really pretty low prescribing rates in comparison to the country as a whole. But, um, and here I've highlighted Polk County where Des Moines is. Um, but it's interesting to see that there's variation even within the state of where these medications are being prescribed most frequently. And then this shows the uh, opioid overdose death rates by country also in I by county also in Iowa. Um, the time period of these is a little bit different, so the maps don't directly overlay each other. And again, Iowa has a lower incidence of opiate overdose deaths than most states in the country. But um, as you can see, again, the, the um, distributions roughly overlap. So here's another chart showing some of the maps between or the types of drug overdose deaths in Iowa. Um, so as you can see, uh, throughout the 2000s, there was a st steady increase in prescription opioid deaths. Um, what this graph is trying to highlight with this supply and expense is that as opioid prescriptions and opioid overdose deaths started to decline, um, heroin deaths started to rise. So this is a concern of many advocates, is that if you cut off the a person's supply of prescription opioids without giving them follow-up medical care or access to treatment or doing a um, medical withdrawal, that people will turn to heroin, which acts basically the same way on the brain and is cheaper and more easily accessible um, in the illicit market. And so there's some fear that reducing supply of opioids without having subsequent referral to treatment will cause an increase in heroin overdose. So this is a chart to show where, where people are getting their opioids from. So as you can see, the gray bar, the, by far the most common, is uh, just given by a friend or a relative, so obtained for free. And as you can see, this chart scales in, by a number of days of past year. So 1 to 29 would be just a few times a year versus 200 to 365 would be like almost every day. Um, so m most people who misuse prescription opioids get them for free. Um, some people will get them prescribed by if one or more physicians, um, stolen, bought from a friend, or bought from some sort of drug dealer. Um, so this is meant to highlight really that opioids are pretty easily accessible for most people. And this is another chart that shows basically the same information, but in a slightly different format. And so, again, as you can see, 54.2% of people obtain them free from a friend or a relative. And then this kind of superscript bar you see around here shows where that friend or relative received them from. So that's, again, mostly just one doctor. Um, this really highlights the importance of taking good care of your prescription drugs and keeping them safe, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end of the presentation. So here's a little bit more data about uh, Polk County, Iowa, for those of you who are based here. Um, 
5% of 11th graders use prescription drugs not from their doctor in the last 30 days, and 4% use them from their doctor, but differently from directions in the last 30 days. And so on the Iowa Youth Survey, this is the way that they formulate questions about misuse of prescription drugs. Um, they're just slightly different types of misuse, if you guys remember from the beginning of the presentation. But 5% and 4% seems like not all that many, but if there are you know, thousands of 11th graders, that's really like a pretty sizable scale. Um, this also aligns pretty well with the rest of the state of Iowa, um, although I don't have a data that compares this to the country. So the last thing I wanna talk about in this data section is fentanyl. Um, it has come up a few times in this presentation already. Um, and as I mentioned or alluded to, fentanyl is a huge contributor in the massive spike in opiate overdose deaths we've seen in the last like two to three years. Um, fentanyl is a legal pharmaceutical. Um, it's used usually in cancer patients. There's a patch and a lollipop, um, but fentanyl has also been increasingly made in labs in China and Mexico um, and shipped by itself or found laced in heroin. Um, fake prescription pills, or even in other drugs like cocaine and marijuana, it's been found more. So fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine and approximately 50 times more potent than heroin, which means that if someone has been using heroin for a long time, has a pretty good idea of their usual dose and what their body can take, having just a little bit of fentanyl in there could cause an overdose because it's just that strong. Um, it is a lot of people who end up using fentanyl don't know they're using fentanyl. And so these overdose deaths are accidental and really, really could be prevented. Um, so this stuff is really scary. Um, people in law enforcement also tend to be pretty skeptical of fentanyl. There have been a few cases of law enforcement officers having an overdose from exposure. Um, so this is really a dangerous new trend. Um, and talking about uh, dangerous to law enforcement and really dangerous drugs, as I mentioned earlier, there are many fentanyl analogs, um, which are chemicals that are very, very similar to fentanyl with just a few twists. Um, some of those are much more potent than fentanyl itself. Uh, the main one being carfentanyl. This is used as a elephant tranquilizer, um, but as you can see, it's 10,000 times stronger than morphine. So this, the stuff that this the fact that this stuff exists is really scary. Um, the first case in Iowa was found in 2016. And so the stuff is around, although it's relatively rare, just something to be aware of. So I'm gonna get into some of the stuff that's been happening at the legislature in Iowa. Um, I, the Iowa Department of Public Health put together this opioid report card which I think is a fantastic tool. Um, it really shows kind of how we're doing in comparison to other states. Um, this is a set of some best practices and evidence-based programs that other states have done to combat opioid misuse in their state. Um, and as you can see, Iowa's not doing very well. We have three of the 10 measures enacted. And so I'm gonna dive a little bit more into what these things mean and what the status is at the legislature. So the first four I'm gonna talk about all together because they all relate to the prescription monitoring program. So what is a prescription monitoring program? It's a database that allows prescribers and pharmacists to track controlled substance prescriptions intended to reduce doctor shopping and help control prescribing. This seems like something that would be obvious to have, but actually this is a really relatively recent innovation. Um, many states have enacted this in various forms with regards to the opiate epidemic. And here in Iowa, we do have a prescription monitoring program. So, but you're not required to use it. So 88% of pharmacists are registered, 46% of prescribers are registered. This varies hugely among disciplines. So for example, dentists have very, very low registration. Um, very few of them use the prescription monitoring program. The current software system we have here is cumbersome and not updated frequently. This is a pretty common thing that doctors and other kinds of prescribers will say keeps them from using it. 
And there is no legally mandated limit on the amount of controlled substance you can dispense, but some pharmacies and insurers have taken the independent action to limit this. A good example is CVS has said it will no longer issue more than seven days of pain medication at a time or of opioid pain medication at a time. So some steps that are being considered in Iowa are mandating use of the prescription monitoring program, especially for new patients or for certain circumstances. Um, there are some efforts to update the software. Um, as with most software update projects, it's taking a lot, long, a lot longer than expected, but they're hoping to have it up soon. Um, there's also been some effort to require updating on a daily basis or on a more frequent basis. Currently, it's there is, tends to be about a two-week lag time, which is not really very helpful. Um, there's also some efforts to make the reports uh, more usable and, in some cases, able a cumulative report able to be accessed by the public. So not violating anyone's confidentiality, but hoping to give people an idea of maybe who some problem prescribers might be in their area. So that's, that's kind of what the prescription monitoring program is. They're also sometimes called prescription drug monitoring programs. So if you see that, um, it's the same thing. They, oh, the prescription monitoring programs also can communicate across state lines. So Iowa communicates with all of its neighboring states as well as New York and Maine. Um, they're working on making that a nationwide scope, but they have not gotten there yet. So again, I'm gonna talk about these next four initiatives all together because these four can all be described as uh, harm reduction approaches. So what is harm reduction? Uh, I really like this definition from the Harm Reduction Coalition. It's a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. And so harm reduction takes kind of the opposite approach to prohibition and accepts the fact that there will always be people who use drugs, um, that some kinds of drug use are less harmful than others, and that there are many ways to, to deal with drug use in a compassionate manner. And so harm reduction really tries to meet people where they are and implement solutions that will work for everyone. So number five on that, Report card with syringe service programs. These are also called syringe, syringe exchange programs or needle exchange programs. Um, they distribute sterile needles and other supplies to prevent the spread of infectious disease and generally make injecting drug use safer. Um, this is really, really, really useful for stopping the spread of HIV and hepatitis C. Um, if you're interested in a story about this, I recommend Googling Scott County, Indiana, where they had a really a rural county in Indiana where they had a really drastic HIV outbreak uh, due to injecting drug use um, and a certain service program was implemented in the county which basically stopped the spread of HIV. Um, it's a really, really effective intervention to prevent these diseases. Um, it also, a certain service program can also oftentimes act as a connection to other types of services. Um, research shows that people who participate in syringe service programs are more likely to enter treatment than other people. Um, they can also connect people to housing or shelters, to food, to health insurance, to other kinds of health care that aren't necessarily drug use related. Um, so they really offer a lot to people who are using drugs. In Iowa, this kind of program is illegal. Um, it's considered to be distributing drug paraphernalia. There is a bill under discussion this session that is hoping to change that language to make this type of program legal. It is being voted on in the House or in the Senate, excuse me, next week, which is the week of March 11th. Um, it's also really urgent that Iowa address this because the CDC rated the state as one of the highest risk for a hepatitis C outbreak, which is a very, very expensive disease to treat and causes a lot of uh, liver issues down the line. Another harm reduction measure on this report card is the Good Samaritan Law. This protects individuals from a low level drug related charges if they call EMS in the case of witnessing an overdose. And so this would be like if I was using with my friend and I saw that my friend was having an overdose, 
uh, I might be afraid to call 911 to get them help, knowing that I've also used drugs and I might be sent to jail or worse. But we really want to encourage people to get medical assistance for whoever might need it. And so this law would protect me from being prosecuted for low level charges uh, because I took the step of calling to get my friend medical assistance. Um, we don't have this law in Iowa. Many other states do. This is a pretty common and generally easy, easily acceptable type of law. This is another proposed bill under discussion this session. Uh, I'm not quite sure of the status of it, but we're really hoping that this will get through also. And then the last intervention is for naloxone, uh, which you may also have heard referred to as Narcan. Narcan is a brand of naloxone. In Iowa, we have a naloxone standing order, which means that the state medical director has basically issued an open prescription to any quote unquote first responder in Iowa, which basically means anyone who might witness an overdose, um, anyone. And so you can go to a pharmacy and pick up naloxone. Um, however, it's quite expensive. Insurance probably won't cover it. Um, and this particular pharmacy you go to might charge differently or have only certain formulations available. So we'd really like to see some money for this as well, but it is pretty easily accessible and many EMS services in Iowa carry naloxone. I'm gonna get a little bit more into this later on in the presentation. So the last two things on this report card are Medicaid coverage for all forms of medication assisted treatment and a required training on the CDC guidelines for managing chronic pain. So the Medicaid is, that's pretty obvious what that means. The state does have that. Um, so people with Medicaid coverage should be able to have access to medication assisted treatment. However, again, we'll get into the accessibility of medication assisted treatment later in the presentation. As far as those CDC guidelines, it's really something that we're trying to encourage more physicians to be up to date on the most modern approach to pain management, which means following these CDC guidelines for opioid prescribing. And so I've just put a sample of the uh, of what these guidelines are here. Um, you can find them easily on the internet. There are they're all clinical like intended for doctors and prescribers, so it's not super important to know what they are, but so, some of the obvious and easy ones to remember are start low and go slow, which means start with the lowest possible dose. And if you need to increase it, do it slowly. Um, another really important thing to talk about is avoiding concurrent benzodiazepine and opioid prescribing. Benzodiazepines are common anti-anxiety meds like Xanax. Um, the two of these drugs used together can drastically increase your risk for overdose. The other kind of like legal type thing that's happening that is not covered in this opioid report card is the lawsuits. So there are, Iowa's joined 40 states in DC to do an investigation of unlawful practices by the manufacturers and distributors of these opioid drugs. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not totally sure how this works, but the intention is that by showing some sort of neglect or uh, poor practices by these companies that they'll be able to obtain money that then can be distributed back to the states to use to improve treatment of um, treatment and prevention in a response to the crisis. Um, there are also 36 counties in Iowa who have sued manufacturers. This includes Polk County, where Des Moines is, and Dallas County. So what is naloxone? What is naloxone? Naloxone is a medication considered as an opioid antidote or antagonist used to counter the effects of opioid overdose. Naloxone restores normal breathing and consciousness and can prevent death or brain damage from lack of oxygen due to an overdose. Naloxone can be given by injection into a muscle, vein, or under the skin or intranasally with the use of a nasal spray. Naloxone kits typically include two ampoules of the medication and safety needles to avoid needle stick injuries and facilitate safe needle disposal. But how does naloxone work? Both naloxone and opioids bind to the same sites in the brain, and these sites affect breathing. The brain has many receptors for opioids. An overdose occurs when too much of any opioid, 
like heroin or OxyContin, fit in too many receptors and slow down breathing. When naloxone is given, it binds more tightly to these receptors and the opioids, and therefore knocks the opioids off and restores breathing. Naloxone acts fast, usually taking effect within 5 minutes, and its protective effect lasts for 30 to 90 minutes. It is always important to call 911 when someone overdoses. People with heart or respiratory conditions and have taken other substances need additional medical attention when naloxone is administered. Naloxone does not get a person high and it does not encourage opioid use. But while naloxone is a safe drug, it may cause individuals independent on opioids to go into withdrawal. Withdrawal symptoms can include pain, high blood pressure, sweating, agitation, and irritability. Naloxone is on the World Health Organization list of essential medicines and has been used in Canada for over 40 years. You do not need to be a medical professional to recognize opioid overdose and administer naloxone. Basic training on how to use naloxone kits is available through community health centers and the kits themselves include a step-by-step -step guide in emergency situations. I like that this describes how naloxone works um, because the science can be a little bit overwhelming, but this gives a pretty good description. Whoops. So how do you give naloxone? There are four formulations available, available in the United States. As they talked about, two of them are a nasal spray, one of which comes in many parts and you have to screw together. Um, Narcan, which is probably the one you've heard of, if you've heard of naloxone, um, it's just a ready-to-use nasal spray. It's super easy. Um, the, it also comes in an auto-injector format and a regular injectable with a syringe um, that is administered intramuscularly, and they recommend it's administered by trained EMS professionals, although lay people can do it too. How do you know if somebody's overdosing? Um, very slow breathing or no breathing. Um, vomiting, blue lips, a uh, slow pulse, uh, maybe weird noises or nodding, and really the main sign is going to be no response when you yell their name or uh, try to wake them up. Uh, oftentimes in the case of an overdose, you'll see drug paraphernalia around. Um, injection is the, one of the most common routes to overdose, so if you see syringes or other types of works around, that's also a reasonably good sign that someone is experiencing an overdose. Risk factors for overdose include mixing drugs. As I talked about earlier, uh, taking opioids and benzodiazepines together is really dangerous. In addition, mixing alcohol with opioids is really dangerous. This is something that we see increasingly in elderly populations where they may not know that taking these drugs together is dangerous or they may be taking their pain medication and also drinking. Um, so again, this is just a common safety thing to know is that uh, these drugs are not really safe to take together. Uh, tolerance is a risk factor. Uh, this is really important in the context of people recently released from prison or recently uh, exiting an inpatient treatment program. If a person has been sober for a period of time and tries to uh, has a relapse or tries to use again, uh, if they use the same dose they were using before, it's likely their tolerance will have decreased and they will experience an overdose. So these are, again, times when it's really, really important to be safe. Um, other risk factors include your physical health. If you're in poor health, you're more likely to overdose. Um, having overdosed in the past is a risk factor. The route of administration. administration. So again, I talked about how injection is pretty common in an overdose, whereas taking a pill orally it takes more time to process and therefore gives you a more um, even experience. And then other factors in the environment, such as if you're maybe using drugs from a new supplier or dealer who you've never, you might not know what's in there. Um, if you're using in a unstable setting, um, different things like that. If you witness an, an overdose, the first thing to do is try to wake them up. Uh, if they don't wake up, you want to call 911. Um, 
For many people experiencing an overdose, all they really need is rescue breathing. Uh, an overdose death is basically just stopping breathing. So if you are trained in CPR or if you know anything about rescue breathing, um, it's relatively easy to do. That's a really good way to assist someone. Um, if that's not helping, go ahead and use naloxone and then continue rescue breathing. Um, and then they say, if there's no response after 30 minutes, use an additional dose. Um, if you can't wait three minutes, if you're starting to get antsy, there's no harm in using more than one dose, um, especially with fentanyl. Sometimes people will require two, three upwards doses. Um, and there is no harm to using more, more naloxone than one dose, but uh, because naloxone does knock those receptors off the brain, it can cause people to go into sudden withdrawal, which will not hurt them, but will probably make them very, very angry, and you will not want to deal with someone going into sudden withdrawal, and they will they will not be having a good time either. So it's best to use the least amount of naloxone as possible. Um, but again, you're if you're in this situation, you want to save a life. Um, again, it's really important to make sure EMS is coming and the person is in recovery position. Um, because naloxone has a pretty short window of activity, um, if the person used a lot, there may still be enough to re-overdose after the naloxone wears off. If you live in Iowa, naloxone is pretty easy to access. Walgreens, CVS, and Medicap pharmacies all carry it. There are also several other local stores that will have it as well. Um, a, new a new negotiation by your state attorney general allows state programs to access at a reduced cost. So this is state public health departments um, or county public health departments, EMS, police and sheriff's offices. Uh, there's some work underway to allow nonprofit groups to get this, but it's not happened yet. Uh, local agencies here in Des Moines that carry naloxone include the sheriff's office, uh, Des Moines Fire, West Des Moines Fire, Clive Fire, and Ankeny EMS. And this is an incomplete list. I know that there are more agencies adding naloxone every day. So if someone experiences an overdose, it's a great time to potentially try to refer them to treatment uh, what kind of treatment is available for opioid use disorder? Um, it's different from other substance use disorders in that there is one established evidence-based treatment that is far and away better than nothing, which is medication-assisted treatment, uh, which is proven to reduce mortality by 50%. Medication-assisted treatments, we'll get into a little bit more of the details in just a sec, but they include methadone, buprenorphine, or uh, naltrexone. Um, these medication-assisted treatment is backed by years and years, decades of research. It really, really helps people. Um, and it's most effective, obviously, in combination with for counseling and other forms of therapy, social support. But getting a person with an opioid use disorder into medication-assisted treatment is the best thing that can be done for them. So like I said, there are three different types, uh, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Here underneath them, I've just written the type of substance it is, uh, the way it affects the brain. Um, this is important to the way it works, but it's kind of a scientific thing, so if you're not interested in that, don't worry about it. So I'm starting here with buprenorphine, which you may have heard referred to as Suboxone or Subutex. Um, these are just, again, different branded formulations of buprenorphine. Uh, this has become probably the medication of choice for many people. Uh, it has a lot of advantages being they it can be prescribed by any doctor. That doctor needs to get a waiver from the DEA and take, I think, like eight to 16 hours of training. It's not a huge commitment, um, but then any doctor can prescribe it. There is less abuse potential than in comparison to methadone. You have the ability to take it home. Uh, some programs want you to have an established record before they allow, allow you this, but it is possible to take home. And it has it's strongly evidence-based. It has, again, years and years of research showing that this really works for people. Disadvantages are that it's more expensive than methadone and it's required to be taken daily. Um, just like with any treatment, 
Suboxone or buprenorphine doesn't work for everyone. Um, I'm, I am not a doctor. I'm not making any recommendations to individu individual people. Methadone is another medication-assisted treatment. You've probably heard of it. It's really inexpensive. It's strongly evidence-based. It, methadone can really, really work. Um, some of the disadvantages are that it requires daily dosing and you have to go to a federally certified opioid treatment program or OTP. So this is really inconvenient for people. I know at some of the centers in Des Moines, there are people driving an hour or two hours every day just to get their methadone. It's also got some abuse potential. Uh, methadone can be sold on the street and does have some value. Um, however, most people in opioid treatment programs are taking it responsibly. And methadone has also notoriously difficult withdrawals. So if a person is in maintenance treatment with methadone for a long time, uh, if they choose to quit that or if they and their doctor choose that, they no longer want or need to be on methadone, the withdrawals can be really kind of trying. And then the last medication-assisted treatment that's available right now is naltrexone, um, most commonly branded Vivitrol. Uh, so the advantage of this is that it's a shot that you get only monthly. So that's a lot less of a commitment than the daily medications. It's useful for people with co-occurring alcohol use, use disorder and opioid use disorder. Naltrexone has been used for a quite a while to treat alcohol use disorder, but has only recently been approved for opioid use disorder as well. Um, this one can be prescribed by any doctor, doesn't require a DEA waiver, it's not a controlled substance, and there is no abuse potential for naltrexone. Um, this is also generally favored in criminal justice settings or when people need to have like a license for their profession because naltrexone is not an opioid agonist, which means that it doesn't work the same way on your body as uh, an opioid, which both buprenorphine and, bup buprenorphine and methadone do to some extent. Um, naltrexone instead completely blocks the ability of an individual to feel or experience a high. Um, the disadvantages are that you're required to fully detox before starting naltrexone, which can be a process that takes a week or more, um, needs to be medically supervised, and oftentimes is a big barrier to entry for people who aren't ready to detox yet. Um, it may increase overdose in the case of relapse, so this gets back to the conversation we had earlier about tolerance. And naltrexone is newer. It doesn't have the evidence base that the other two methods medications do, uh, and there's some skepticism that it works as well or that it should be used in the same settings. Um, however, lots of people have found success with Vivitrol as well. So I, I know this is small and kind of technical, but I wanted to have a chart that compared everything right next to each other. Um, some highlights here are that me mechanism of action again, both methadone and buprenorphine work in a similar way to uh, an abused opioid, but they are, the specific pharmacology of it allows it to not induce a high while allowing someone to not have those cravings and live a normal life. So as I said, medication-assisted treatment is the best form of treatment available. However, most substance, substance use disorder treatment programs don't offer any form of medication-assisted treatment, and very, very few offer all three. And so I like this GIF from AMFAR, the American Foundation for AIDS Research, that shows kind of how the, um, how, how many treatment programs are in the United States, which just starting with is not enough. Um, when you look at the ones that offer medication-assisted treatment, you've only got about two in five of those that offer anything, and very, very few offer all three. For those of you who are in Des Moines or Polk County, you can see we are, it looks like one of the only counties in Iowa that has access to this, so that's great for us and pretty unfortunate for everyone else in Iowa. Um, 
this is something that's really important to adequately addressing the opioid epidemic is that people in treatment should have access to medication assisted treatment it helps a lot of people it's it's just it's just a good thing to have Uh, if you do live in Polk County or the Des Moines area, these are the programs that I know offer medication-assisted treatment. Um, uh, United Community Services, which whose name has recently changed to UCS Healthcare, I should update this PowerPoint to reflect that, is a federally certified opioid treatment program that offers all three types of medication-assisted treatment. Um, I've been to their facilities. I really like it. Uh, so if you are interested in having methadone, uh, buprenorphine or suboxone or Vivitrol. You can get any of them there. People there are super nice. Um, yeah, we also have the Center for Behavioral Health is another federally certified opioid treatment program. And both Prelude and Primary Healthcare offer buprenorphine or suboxone treatment. Um, there's a new clinic called Covert Action that offers suboxone treatment. This is not a complete list. Um, a lot of this, too, might be finding a doctor who you like. There are some doctors who just prescribe Suboxone without offering counseling, or you might want to find a substance use disorder program that offers some of the more traditional pro approaches and also uh, use medication-assisted treatment. However, many traditional substance use disorder treatment programs are hostile to medication-assisted treatment. Um, you may have heard the phrase, oh, it's just replacing one drug with another. Um, the evidence shows that that's really not true, and it allows people with a opioid use disorder to really, really live a improved quality of life in comparison to not having treatment, and it cuts mortality in half. Um, it's also having a substance use disorder has been compared to having diabetes or some other chronic condition that requires medication. You would never, ever say, oh, well, you can't make your own insulin. You're just replacing it with a shot. That doesn't make any sense. Um, it's the same with people with substance use disorder. So it's really, really important to encourage more programs to be open to this, to increase the the spread of substance use disorder programs, especially in states like Iowa that have a lot of rural counties. Um, this is going to really make a big difference in stopping the crisis. So we'll get to the what can you do as an individual. Prescription drug take back is really important. Um, asking your doctor and your healthcare providers about the PMP. Uh, ask them if they use it. If you're getting some sort of prescription, act, ask them to check it on you. Um, many doctors just don't know about it or don't know that their patients want it. So having that demand on them can be really helpful. And then advocate in your community. Talk to people about it. See what they know. See what they think. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of misconceptions about drug use. Um, having someone who knows a little bit can be really, really helpful. Um, and if you live in Iowa or another state talking about this, uh, if you want to call your legislators, that's a really good way to do stuff as well. So just a little bit more about prescription drug take back. As we learned earlier in this presentation, a lot, most people who use uh, prescription opioids get them for free from someone that they know. And so I know it's happened in my family where, you know, you go and you have wisdom teeth or you have some sort of surgery and you get your pain pills and then maybe you take what like two or three of them and the rest of them end up in a medicine cabinet somewhere uh, this happens to everyone it, it seems like um, but if you have those pills in your house they could be a huge risk for yourself for your family members for friends or guests um, so it's important to handle them responsibly uh, there's lots of drug take back sites so if this is the ones in polk county the Little orange bottles represent pharmacies, and the badges represent law enforcement agencies that take them back. Um, they'll take them back at any time. You don't have to make an appointment or anything. You can just walk in. Um, if you live in Iowa, this is from the Governor's Office of Drug Control Policy page, where they have all of the sites listed in Iowa. If you live outside of Iowa, you can probably find it through a government website in your state. This is a really easy thing that you can do that keeps your drugs somewhere safe. And so this, I like this graphic because it shows the, the steps that we're taking. So prevent people from starting. That's what we here at on the prevention team in EFR do. We're on the community 
um, doing education, talking to kids, um, just trying to build awareness and let people know how dangerous heroin and opioids are. Um, you want to reduce addiction by increasing access to medication-assisted treatment. Again, it's far and away the best option for most people with an opioid use disorder. It should be available to everyone. And reversing overdose by expanding the use of naloxone, training people on naloxone use. It's a really, really beneficial drug. And that'll be the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you learned something. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions. Uh, that'll be ekline, uh, E-K-L-E-I-N, at EFR.org. Um, I always like to answer questions about the opioid epidemic. Let me know if you have anything uh, more you want to know. Thank you.